Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm back with my last episode with Mark McLaughlin. Mark is an elite performance coach. He's trained athletes that are in high school, NFL players, Olympians. And today, we're going to talk about training special operators, training special operators that or people that want to qualify going into selection, the process for that, and then also how he trains people that are already operational for long deployments in austere locations. We're going to talk about the value of developing an aerobic base and a massive aerobic engine, balancing strength and power, managing HRV with chaotic workloads. We're going to talk about strengthening tendons for high volumes of work that these guys got to go through. It's a fascinating episode. So if you've ever been interested in how people get ready for, you see like Hell Week and some of these uh, you know, YouTube channels or people going to the Q school, this is going to be a great episode. You're going to get a lot out of it. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Ever since the Bin Laden raid, People have had a different perspective on what's actually going on in our special operations community. Like before then, most people had no clue what SEAL Team 6 was or they didn't know what CAG was or any of this stuff. And now there's kind of this obsession with it. I've worked in that world. You've trained and developed a lot of people in that community. There's people that may be listening to this that want to maybe go out for a selection. Let's talk about what it takes to actually train and develop for this. I mean, you've worked with people that are going to like the FBI Academy, all sorts of different stuff. Like, what is it that you need to be doing to build the capacity to go take on these multi-evolution type of approaches of long duration stress and be able to thrive? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And yeah, the the special operations world is is totally different. And I I used to think of them as athletes, and over the years, I've kind of changed the way that I look at them from a tactical athlete. I don't even think that's right. I think it's just, they're just big stress indoors, and how to make them as robust physiologically, because athletes, and even every, like, we have, you know, set meals, you know, we have set times when we wake up and, and go to bed, and and during different times, like these operators, like they don't, right? Like they just do not. And I think I kind of break it down into three categories. There's the pre like high school or college kids that are just entering into the military. So like the BUDS program or, you know, getting into ranger school. Then there are the guys that are uh, gals who are in action or seeing action. And then there's post-military service. So there's kind of those three categories that I look at, and each of them require a different mindset. And I'll take, for example, like going into BUDS or something like that. Like, you just need to be physically, as physically prepared as possible. You have to want and understand what you are going to endure. And you can be as physically prepared as you are but at the end of the day if you don't want that job and you're not willing to endure the suck beyond what any of us probably could ever think about then there's nothing i can give you to prepare you for that you have to want that Mm -hmm. but then from that development side it's all based on physiology like building up that aerobic capacity building up the slow and fast fibers understanding the events that they're going into. So like, you know, SEAL team, the bud selection, there seems to be a lot of overhead holds and boat and stuff like that. So, you know, trying to build that upper body capacity in a way. So, you know, I've done that with kids. You know, we did a lot of cross-country skiing, roller skiing, oxidative, shoulder press, bench press, like because a lot of people's upper body just is not durable to withstand that, even though guys obviously make it through because they want to. But from a physical preparation standpoint, that's how I look at it. And then the guys that are downrange or that are in action, like, okay, now that's where the HRV like really comes into light. Like, hey, man, if you're in a mission and you're red, it doesn't matter, right? Like, you still have to go. So just trying to keep them as fit 
and as engaged in the training process as possible. And then when they're on downtime or not in the arena or doing these training exercises, that they're trying to stay as healthy, as fit, and as on schedule as they can be. Mm. I'm interested in like these people going to these different selection processes. Like, yeah. How are you developing the capacity and the capability of the fast and slow tissues? Yeah. So, you know, I was fortunate enough a few years back, I trained a, a gentleman for a Delta Force selection. And these guys are phenomenal in that they put 100% into it. They don't know whether they will or won't get selected. If they don't get selected, they don't even tell you why you didn't get selected. And the Delta selection is two weeks long. And this kid made it through both times, didn't get selected either time, and he didn't know why. Mm. So I look at it from building that cardiac system from a standpoint of how it looks on HRV. So they have a robust cardiac system. So very low heart rate training. They may do 7 to 12 hours a week of that work. And... It's through rucking, it's through running, it's through cycling. Delta operators tend to be on the lighter side, per se, so they can maybe handle more running. But, you know, if you're 200 plus pounds, you're not going to be running 60 miles a week. So then you have to find other means to develop these systems that are orthopedically sound and that they like to do and that show benefit you know, long-term. And then through on the weightlifting side, it could be some very hard, because those guys like to train hard. So you need to give them certain things that are hard to them, but that are also going to give us a beneficial adaptation that is going to allow them to do their job. I wouldn't say better, but when the call comes to allow them to be at their highest level possible. Real quick, if you can think about how you found this podcast, somebody probably shared it with you via text or a post on social media. The only way we grow is through word of mouth. So do me a favor, share it with somebody else. If it was a post or a text or a review, would you please consider doing the same thing? Because I'm positive this will make an impact in somebody else's life. Do you see guys that are doing all of this endurance work, low intensity endurance work, having a hard time maintaining a <laughs> Right. Like that's the, people always say that. And so I'll give you an example, a gentleman that both you and I know, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, who's been training with me now for almost a year. I think he told me like the heaviest uh, trap bar deadlift he had done in the last, I don't know four or five years was maybe 400 pounds. Okay. So the other day he did 515 and he's running, you know, a, a six, I think his best mile right now is like pace is like 605. So if you structure the training right, you can keep that strength. I look at the cross country skiers who are some of the most fit individuals, some of the most amazing athletes and they do a, a lot of max strength work, low reps, high load at times, kind of depending on who the athlete is. But, you know, there's just no reason why if you're monitoring it and you understand how to program it and then understand how that individual is responding to the training, that they can't continue to get strong and then aerobically fit at the same time. And I will also mention that this gentleman has a resting heart rate that's 33 and a half, 33.5. Okay. That's unbelievable. He did 110 push ups the other day in a row. And like exactly. 105, yeah, and like 105 sit ups and what, 24 pull ups. So when people say, ah, oh, you know, you're not going to get strong, it's like, okay, that's just BS. Oh my goodness. I mean, this is like, how long did it take to get to this point? I mean, these are years of training he's been doing, but he's been working with you for a year. Yeah. And you know, he came in, I mean, his resting heart rate, I think the first HRV was like 35. Okay. So he has that quality and, you know, you worked with him for, you know, so he has a long history, but it just still goes to show you that 
you can have these different qualities and still excel at strength or be strong and still excel on the aerobic side for these guys. Like, and it's all based on durability for them. Like they just have to be super robust. Yeah. I, I would think like for me, like I struggle with tendonitis. It's a genetic thing. I actually had like a, uh-huh. one of those tests done and it's just like, there's certain exercises. If I do it, I will get tendonitis and it takes a very long time for it to go away. Yeah. I would just not be great at that because the amount of repeated evolutions that they have to do, especially in the selection process, over and over and over and over. My body would just break down. It just would. Yeah, I mean, some guys hit the genetic lottery and, you know, the job selects them. And then for the rest of us mortals, sometimes like Mm -hmm. you're right, like that job, you'd be out like in the first hour or something. So, yeah. You could do certain things, but we all have our, our different strengths. But if somebody's yep. listening to this and there's like, hey, I, I know somebody that wants to train up for one of these schools, or I know somebody that's active duty and they could really use your help, where would you send them? Yeah, so go to ptconline.co, and there's an information tab there that they can fill out and send me. And then from there, then we can start kind of going back and forth uh, to determine if, you know, if it's the right fit for them. I love it. Mark, I appreciate you. I'm thankful for the work that you're doing. You're impacting a lot of people's lives, you know, from kids all the way up to grown adults doing really dangerous things. And I just really appreciate that. Thanks again, Eric. Appreciate the time. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And I hope you enjoyed these past three episodes with Mark. And if you're looking for specialized training for maybe a youth athlete or somebody that wants to be a special operator that you may know, definitely connect with him, follow him on social media, ask him questions. He's one of the best I know. Thanks again for listening. I'll catch you on the next episode.